Hello, my name is Host Eric, I'm the Talking with Fans People and author of Gospel of the Pantheon. <laughs> it was a hundred thousand million years ago, things were really slow, nobody else yet to show, place the slabs below, and plant them so, the plan can start to go. More years into and tears gnashing through Oh holy slaps come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go Welcome back Chapter 7, The Colony at the Pass. Verse 1. <laughs> in 1874, the Duchess met with a pair of traders whom she had dealt with several times in the past. They were two brothers named Allo and Cam Memzer, and they provided the Duchess with information. As in the past, the men were dispatched by the Duchess's regent to a small, poorly lit room in the back corner in a back corner room of her estate, this room, unlike the Duchess's chamber, had three chairs. The Memsers sat and waited nearly forty minutes for the noblewoman to arrive. When she at last entered the room, they stood. Sit down. They sat. You have news, said the Duchess, matter-of-factly, as she took her seat behind the large wooden desk that dominated the room. I indeed we do. Two things you'll find significant, we think, said Allo. The Duchess motioned for them to proceed. Du Grando is dead, milady, said Cam. Grondo is dead, are you sure? Absolutely, said both men in unison. Then Grondovich has been made duke, asserted the Duchess. He has, said Cam, which appears to be why the old duke died. You see, it was his son who killed him, and why else do heirs kill their fathers? Grondovich was tired of waiting for him to die on his own. This news had much significance of truth of the Duchess, but she had lived a long time and had learned to be skeptical. She had... No doubt the Grondo was dead, but Grondovich's responsibility for the death, that rang a little untrue. How do you know for sure the son killed the father? asked the Duchess of the Memsers. These facts have been confirmed by several eyewitnesses, said Allo, and the confirmations were obtained separately by both Cam and myself, my lady. The Duchess drummed her fingers on the table. She knew very little about Grondovich. Ilminston's new duke, but what she little she thought she did know didn't jive with the story of regicide. For example, she knew that Grondo had never allowed his son to lead troops into battle. Some might have allowed for the possibility that this had stemmed from Grondo's concern for his son's safety, but the Duchess felt she had understood Grondo well, and he was not that kind of guy. The noblewoman had always thought that the son was likely incompetent. If the Memsers' account were true, however, she would have to rethink this perspective. Now, back in, in 1872, Duke Grondo had sent a courier to New Hampshire with a request the Duchess provide men and supplies to support the war he waged to the east. He had set, uh, sent a battalion of men armed with handguns to accompany the courier, as he thought that this show of force would help the Duchess understand that his was not a request that she could afford to decline. By the time the courier and the troops had reached New Hampshire City, however, all but half a dozen or so of the handguns had broken, and those that hadn't jammed incessantly. The land simply would not accept the technology. The Duchess had instructed her city and honor guards to prepare for battle. She was unwilling to accept these foreign troops in her land, but her men found themselves facing an essentially disarmed opponent. They rounded up Grondo's forces, and the Duchess ordered all but ten of the invaders killed, and instructed that the lucky ten survivors were to watch the executions of the rest. She then sent the ten survivors back to the Duke with a very simple message that she herself pinned on parchment and sealed with wax. It read, The Duke of New Hampshire respectfully declines your request for troops and supplies, but thanks for your interest. Signed, the Duchess of New Hampshire. Thus the Duchess came to understand the role that uneven time played in military affairs, and she saw that though her own duchy was the least advanced, she did not necessarily operate at a disadvantage. She could handle the old bull-headed Grondo. But Grondovich might prove more dangerous. She needed more information about the man. Tell me specifically how it happened, instructed the Duchess. The son waited the son waited until his father slept and then slit his throat with a long dagger, said Allo. I spoke with a serving girl who saw the whole thing. She said that Grondovich did it casually, as if he gave it hardly any thought at all. 
But besides the eyewitnesses, the story's all over Ilmingsen, and everybody tells basically the same version of events, added Cam. The Duchess stared hard at the two brothers. They were not twins, but they looked a lot alike, and she could never remember which was which. Each was portly and balding and sweaty, and each dressed in a slightly gaudy clothing popular with the merchant class. Each wore an embroidered vest and loose velvet pants, though not of precisely the same color or design. The Duchess was inclined to be skeptical of any information that she paid for, but the Memsers were not lying. These two men hadn't the courage to explicitly lie to her, nor the skill to get away with it. Spicing up what they knew, making it appear more valuable than it was, perhaps. They were greedy men, she knew that. But this seemed cut and dry. Nothing about the story felt embellished. It just didn't feel quite right. But given the apparent consensus in Ilmingston regarding the account of what happened, she thought it safe to conclude in this case that not only were they not lying, they weren't wrong either. All right, then, she said. That's good to know. What is the other item you wish to bring to my attention? Well, it appears that at his time of his death, Grondo had largely lost the war, said Allo. He had mostly run out of men. During the fortnight Cam and I were in Elmison City, we saw a thin but steady stream of soldiers returning from the east, a most sorry lot, most of them badly wounded, and according to those who returned, Gronovich has ordered all remaining troops to return to the capital. News from East Elmiston corroborates this, added Cam. We have heard reports that Elmiston and East Elmiston have signed a war fighting postponement. Now, this was news that the Duchess had no trouble believing. She had known that the war had not been going well for Grando. The old Duke had been periodically attacking East Elmingston off and on for decades, and East Elmingston had no doubt learned to construct each defensive fortification design they used with increasing efficiency and quality over the years to the detriment of Elmingston's forces. Also good to know, she said. She pulled out a small bag of silver coins and tossed them on the desk in front of the brothers. Good work, gentlemen, but Gronovich is still an unknown. We mustn't take him for granted. He's weak now, but unlike his father, he apparently has the sense to know when to lick his wounds, which means he's likely smarter than his father, and he apparently is a bit more devious as well, given that the father is the dead one. He will take the time to rebuild the army, right? I think we can count on that, and while we always knew where Grondo's guns were pointed, we will not know what his son intends to do until he does it. What I need from you are updates on his progress doing so, if you can acquire any such information. The father was obsessed with East Elmingston, but the son may look the other direction and see us a lower hanging fruit. The brothers nodded in response. Return to your trading, gentlemen, the Duchess concluded, but keep your eyes and ears open, and if you learn anything, inform me immediately. We will, Duchess, said Allo. As you command, Duchess, said Cam. Cam then picked up the coins from the desk, and the two men rose from their chairs, bowed, and turned and walked out of the room. Now that she was alone, she gave this Elmingston matter her full attention, and the more she thought about what the Memsers had told her, the more she began to, feel, began to feel as though her concerns were justified. In 1872, when facing Grondo's men, she had been lucky. Had the old Duke equipped that battalion with swords as well as handguns, she would have had a real fight on her hands. The Duchess had never liked spending money on maintaining a sizable, well-equipped army, so even just one of Grondo's battle-tested battalions would have given her token forces trouble had said battalion been equipped with blades. But outside of that one time, she had never had occasion to regret avoiding expenditures on defense. For one thing, Grondo had always directed the bulk of his aggressions at East Elmingston. Had he been driven by some irrational he had been driven by some irrational hatred towards his neighbors to the east, and for as long as that war had continued, the Duchess had felt comfortable that Elmingston was little real threat to her rule in New Hamptonshire. Rondo might have conceivably bloodied her lip, but only to the extent that doing so might help him in his fight against the Easterners. And to the west of the Duchess were the Acutronians. They operated some sort of federation of independent towns and wanted no part of politics or war, even though they alone had the full library of designs, including all military designs. The Duchess was unsure where they stood regarding uneven time. She suspected it varied between the regions. But she knew that whatever sort of objects and tools an Acutronian land did support, the Acutronians made sure each of was of the highest quality. So they were both non-aggressive and an unattractive target. And as a consequence, the people to the east of New Hampshire had a long-standing habit of peace and a determination to keep it that way. They posed no threat to the Duchess. To the south lay the Earldom of York. It was the smallest of her neighbors and was ruled by the Smythes, who, generation after generation, proved themselves disinterested in the general health and strength of their earldom. The Smythes devoted their attention to their own lavish indulgences and social dramas, which meant that they were largely ineffective in other matters. York was no threat. 
Lastly, to the north of New Hamptonshire lay the sea and a rocky, shallow coastline that, except for one small harbour, was unfriendly to ships. Hers were not a seafaring people, and the respective naval powers of the world therefore, therefore posed little risk to her duchy. And the bottom line is, the Duchess hadn't needed to worry about maintaining a real fighting force for a long time. Now that would apparently have to change. But the noblewoman was still loath to waste money on something so not unproductive as the military. Then, while musing about all this, the Duchess was struck by an idea, and it seemed like an idea that, if she could pull it off, would protect her from Grandovich, cost very little, and perhaps in the long term even annex her some land and bring in some additional revenue. As the plan took shape, her enthusiasm grew until, at last, her concern about the risk that Grando's death posed were outweighed by her excitement about the opportunity it presented. Verse 2 The Duchess returned to her chamber, finished her lunch, and had her dishes taken away. Then she spread out a map of the aisle on top of her desk. Shortly thereafter, a guard stepped into the room. Corporal Wisdom has arrived, Duchess, and requests permission to enter. Send him in. Corporal Wisdom looked every bit the military man. Not so much in the face, which was young, pleasant, and unmemorable, but the rest of him for sure. His hair was close, closely cropped, his dress uniform was impeccably kept, and he looked as though he had never slouched once in his life. Although the Duchess had long avoided raising a large standing army, she did maintain the city guard and her personal honor guard, and she managed both of these forces personally, and chose her officers carefully. She selected for promotion only those men both possessing unwavering loyalty and standout skill. Despite having been born in York, Wisdom was one such man. He was a tension, and a very devout one at that, so he respected hierarchy and rules a great deal, and he demanded of himself strict adherence to all protocol. Tensions made inseparable companions, but they made great underlings. The corporal approached the desk, knelt to one knee, bowed his head, and said, Corporal Wisdom, reporting as instructed, my lady, before rising and reassuming his ramrod stance. So I see, Corporal. The Duchess pointed to the map. Tell me, how many routes are there from Ilmingston into New Hamptonshire, and what do you know about them? You may consult the map if you wish. Wisdom didn't need to. There are only two routes, Duchess. The most direct is through the pass to the northeast. It is the only such pass along the border between Ilmingston and New Hamptonshire. The second route is to the south, across the Neural River, and then through York. It is less direct, but it is favored, except in the summer, because the northern parts of Ilmingston get a lot of rain and sometimes even snow, and the roads from the capital through the pass and into New Hamptonshire become very muddy and difficult to travel the rest of the year. Very good, Corporal. I'm impressed. Thank you, Duchess. Now, Corporal, if you were to lead an invasion of New Hamptonshire from Ilmingston, which route would you take? I would wait until summer and lead my men through the pass, my lady. And why is that? Because the land between Hamptonshire City and the pass are largely unpopulated. It would be possible to move a large force through the, to the very gates of the city before being noticed. It would avoid my troops the advantage of surprise. It would be impossible, on the other hand, to move any sizable force through York without being noticed. Good. Anything else? Well, of course, if a commander was to take the southern route, and if New Hampshire was alerted to his troop movements, as certain seems almost certain, then the commander of our forces, excuse me, I mean the New Hampshire forces, could simply position his troops at the bridge and hold it with relative ease, and if he found himself at risk of losing the bridge, he could burn the bridge. There is no other way across. No other way, Corporal? asked the Duchess, raising an eyebrow. It might be possible to cross in boats, but the fast and turbulent waters of the Nero make boats a very iffy proposition, and as commander of the invading forces, I'd likely have to travel 80 miles to the east, where the river broadens and the water becomes calm, to ferry my men across, and that would put me squarely amidst the city states of the Actronians. It seems unlikely they would allow my Ilmingston troops to march across their lands to enter New Hampshire from the west. Well done, Corporal. You've gotten the situation just right. The Corporal said nothing, but the Duchess could see that he was pleased by the praise. So then, continued the Duchess, let's put you back on our team now. If you anticipated an invasion of New Hampshire by Ilmingston, what measures would you take to prepare for her defense? Well, foremost, I'd raise an army, my lady. The city guard and your honor guard are capable and well trained and provide ample muscle to keep order within the duchy, but would be insufficient to meet an invading army. Of course, Corporal, but I'm interested in strategic specifics here. Well, I'd build fortifications here, where the pass empties onto the plain at the northeastern border of New Hamptonshire, said Wisdom, and he indicated the spot on the map. Almost, Corporal. You have the right idea. Now let me explain to you the situation and put aside the hypotheticals. Duke Grondo is dead. His son killed him and assumed the throne. 
Corporal Wisdom was surprised to learn this. I had not heard, Duchess. He said, that is interesting news indeed. Of course you hadn't, replied the Duchess. I just learned of it myself this morning. The Corporal flushed a bit of this small group. Oh, give me, Duchess. I did not mean to presume. The Duchess dismissed the apology with a wave and continued, And I learned another piece of news this morning as well. It appears that the war with East Ilminston has been going very badly. Ilminston's army is in tatters, and Gondovich has signed a war fighting proponent and recalled all of his surviving soldiers to Ilminston City. One can only assume he plans to rebuild the army. My concern is that Grondovich is not his father. It appears that he is somewhat more savvy than Grondo, and it seems likely that he will not be driven by the irrational hatred of East Ilmingston that consumed Grondo and decided the man's every course. So I fear that when Grondovich has rebuilt his forces, he will look west to New Hampshire. Or York, said Wisdom. It would be an easier target. Possibly, shrugged the Duchess, but York's hardly worth taking. New Hampshire has wealth and ample good productive farmland and forests in the north, not to mention the Cathedral of Squalor, which has accumulated much treasure and would appear ripe for plunder to any who would be conqueror. The corporal nodded. Which brings me to why I, which brings me to why I summoned you. I wish you to build the fortifications you mentioned earlier, but I want you to rebuild them here at the other end of the pass, she said, pointing to the spot on the map. But that is in Ilminston, Duchess. To build fortifications there would be tantamount to a declaration of war. Yes, Corporal, the plan has its risks, but do you see what sits right beside the entrance to the pass? Ilminston stone quarries. New Hampton Shire needs access to that stone, Corporal, and the location of the quarries will greatly facilitate the construction of fortifications. It is September now, so whatever quarrying Ilminston may be doing will close for the season soon. But well, one month from today, I want you to lead 600 of our people to this location. You are to establish a colony there. You are to work through the winter, training these peasants into soldiers, and you are to begin fortifying the area. With a little luck, and perhaps a late spring, Brodovich will not learn of your presence there until June. And if you have prepared well, I suspect he will not be militarily ready to deal with you before the rains begin again. And in that case, he will have to wait until the following summer. The corporal looked as though he had his doubts about the plan, but he said nothing else other than, as you wish, Duchess. The Duchess took steps to reassure the man of the viability of the plan. You will begin this colony well supplied, both with weapons and food and whatever else you need to succeed, and you will continue to receive shipments of provisions through the first winter. Come spring, you will see to it your colonists put in at least some crops, because I do expect this colony to be self-sufficient eventually, but I don't expect miracles, Corporal, and my top priority is to secure the pass and the quarries. Which fortification blueprint would you have me use, Duchess, and will you equip me with Acutronian builders? Good questions, Corporal, and ones I wish to address at some length. This project is important to me, and so I'm going to authorize you to carry with you a copy of every fortification blueprint in our library, as I believe our library is current. For what I pay the Acutronians it had better be, this means that you will carry every fortification blueprint yet delivered to the people. You will have no fewer than twenty design choices. Twenty choices? exclaimed the corporal. I had no idea there were so many different walled encampments. Yes, well, we do try to restrict the dissemination of such blueprints. Accutron delivers them to the Accuturnians. We pay well to have access to all possible designs, and we hope that others elect not to. We have no control over whether they do, but we can ensure that we don't give away to others for free what we have paid handsomely for, which is why I want to stress that no one, absolutely no one, but yourself and the Accuturnians are to see any of these blueprints. You are to evaluate the area and choose the design quickly, and once you have made your choice, you are to immediately burn all of the others. I still have the originals here, and once you've chosen, you will have no need for the copies of the ones you didn't choose, so burn them. Is that clear? Absolutely, not just said the man, but he still marveled over what he had learned. Twenty! Remarkable! Well, some of the designs may be for lookout towers or walls, conceded the Duchess, but at least ten should specifically be blueprints for a walled encampment. Corporal Wisdom nodded his understanding. Ten was still many more possible encampment designs than he ever would have su suspected. Now, regarding your other question, Corporal, I will send you with three Accutronian advisors paid in advance through the end of the first year. They will assess the location, advise which blueprint is most well suited. I cannot afford to equip you with Accutronian labor, obviously, but with the help of the advisors, you should be able to select the best design at short order, and they can help train your people to execute the blueprint with at least some degree of competency. I understand and will comply, my lady.
snapping to appropriate military rigidity, said Corporal Wisdom. But the Duchess sent the through the strict adherence to hierarchy some lingering doubts, and she wanted more than man's compliance. She wanted his faith and his enthusiasm. So first she sighed and lowered her head, and she folded her hands before her on the desk, as if overwhelmed by the responsibility of her throne. And when she at last looked again into Wisdom's eyes, her own eyes shone with urgency, and they revealed vulnerability. Will you do this for me, Corporal Wisdom? she asked the soldier. I ask this of you because you are the best I have. I have complete faith in both your loyalty to the dukedom and in your skills as a soldier and as a leader. I would not ask this of you if I did not believe you could do it. The Duchess held wisdom gaze for a few seconds in silence to drive the importance of the point home, and the importance indeed did not escape wisdom. Milady, I will not let you down, he said quietly and with earnest intensity. This was exactly why the Duchess found wisdom so valuable. He truly believed in his Duchess and in such things as duty and honor and what not. I know I can count on you, for you have served me ever with distinction. But do not think my gratitude will be limited to a simple thank you, for this colony will need to be governed by you, and only titled nobility are fit to govern the people. So from this day forth, you shall be called Viceroy Wisdom, and you will rule the lands surrounding the pass and the quarries in my stead, and regarding all matters within those lands, your word is law, and you will answer to no one except me. Duchess, I, I I don't know what to say, stammered Wisdom, eyes wide and shining with excitement. Thank you, my lady. No, Viceroy Wisdom, it is you who has the thanks of all the peoples of New Hampshire, and you have my personal gratitude as well. The bravery you display here today in taking on this difficult task befits your new title. Truly, you have the spirit of a nobleman, the spirit of a Viceroy. The Duchess feared perhaps she had laid it on a little too thick, but soon she thought that the speech had hit its mark. In fact, the Duchess had caused Wisdom to so strongly feel the chivalric gravitas of the occasion that the young man appeared to be barely able to contain his eagerness to faithfully serve. The new voice for it was awash in the majesty of feudalism, and these emotions welled up into him, in him until at last he could contain the richness of it all no longer. Before the righteous eyes of Densha said Wisdom, dropping to one knee and bowing his head, and before your own beautific grace. Gaze, my duchess, I offer you my oath. I shall turn all threats, come they by way of the wild beast, or by way of the sword and bow of man, or by way of the winds and waters of heaven's fury. So long as I live, I do swear to wreak savage violence upon any who challenge your sovereignty over those lands. This plan, thought the duchess, might just work. If we're going to see a, a next chapter, we'll see Elias Cork in the Church of Curtis. So let's uh, play a song and say goodbye. It was a hundred thousand million years ago. Things were really slow. Nobody else yet to show. Place the slabs below and plant them so the plan can start to go. More years into and tears gnashing through Oh holy slaps come into view At last holy resolve from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go